Welcome to the January 27th edition of the PFF forecast. This one's great because we have this kind of week between and we're going to talk draft. One of the best things that has ever existed is the NFL draft. Mike Renner is going to join us, have a great conversation about quarterbacks, receivers. He has some great comps, uh, teams that should trade up. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I have a surprise for my good friend, Eric. We're going to do a little bachelor recap. Let's rock. Right. We're in the, the Super Bowl lull week. How are you feeling? I'm trying to get a pulse. You've been tweeting out philosophical Chiefs tweets all I'm feeling week. feeling good. We're not going to talk much gambling today. No. I will I will give up one pick, though. The okay. national team in the, in the Senior Bowl is the bright bet. You amaze me. You never cease to, really. You've I'm just already saying, bet on the Senior Bowl. I, I, used, I just like do a little. I, I work with the rosters a little bit. Yeah. A little, little fun stuff. God yeah. damn you. The, Nash, the national team. The national team, yeah. Okay. Because the National League, I thought you were talking baseball for a second. I got worried. Mike Renner is going to be on right now. We're going to talk about the draft and the draft guide. If you have not gotten a draft guide yet, may, may God have mercy on your soul. Mm -hmm. Mike Renner, let's get it. All right. We are in true draft fashion, grinding through it right now. You probably, hopefully can't hear this on the podcast, but there is someone who's like sawing through steel on the other side. I was going the song into the studio. It sounds <laughs> like. do, you, do you wonder if uh, this is what it sounds like in somebody's brain when they're grinding tape? We'd have to ask Mike. Yeah. Basically. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing else going on. It's just a saw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're doing this. We, uh, every year, we want to start talking about the draft as soon as possible. And this feels like the right week. The draft guide just came out. If you haven't gotten one yet, I honestly just don't know what you're doing with your life, especially because the promo code Super Bowl 25 will get you 25% off any annual subscription. The draft guide comes with both Edge and Elite. Mike Renner is the guy that does all the analysis for that draft guide. There are a bunch of people that put in countless hours for it. It's awesome. I've read like 10 player profiles and it's taken up a solid bit of like the past four nights. So kudos to you, bro. Appreciate it. Um, let's start with this. I actually want to go back to last year's draft okay. because I feel like Eric and I can probably say we learned some things, but I'm curious, what did you learn from last year's draft, draft class, the results of that, that impacted you most this year? I think the biggest thing I learned is not to overrate. If a guy didn't do something in college, not to say that he can't do it or not to overrate that fact that he didn't do something. I think the biggest one that we kind of harped on was Jeff Jefferson, slot receiver at LSU. This past year when he had all that monster production and we were saying you know hesitant to say he couldn't win on the outside uh or couldn't win versus press because we didn't see it you didn't get press a lot maybe like 50 snaps all year versus press and slot press is way different than outside press uh and so we're saying that we're hesitant to be high on a guy because we didn't see him do a certain thing but i think you can see a skill set and the other guy in that class was brandon iu who mm -hmm. didn't run a lot of routes but i think you can look at a skill set and what goes into say beating press coverage like the thing that we said hey we don't know if jefferson can do it because we didn't see it and look at what other guys or what does it take to be press coverage what do you have to have in your repertoire for brandon now what do you have to have in your repertoire as a route runner to be good at running routes i think both those guys had it both those guys had those things yeah. and we just kind of overlooked it saying we hadn't seen it so we're going to be hesitant on it whereas i think you got to dig a little deeper into into a projection more so than purely relying on would would teams. herbert qualify well, i also think makai beckton was another Mekhi one oh, as well. interesting. Yeah. who just didn't have a lot of pass for reps yeah. against anyone worth a darn in pass protection but it's like when he did have pass for reps like he had the balance he had the, obviously the physicality and like the movement skills where it's like you can extrapolate that out to where when you have when he's that physically freakish it's going to put him ahead of the curve and ahead of a lot of guys. Once It's going to make his life easier once he gets to the NFL. Do you yeah. think, real quick, because I want you to talk about Becton and Herbert here, but for Jefferson, do you think that it would have been different uh, as an outside receiver with Brady and Burrow? 
Like if they had played him on the outside. Oh, okay. Um, I still don't think like that's quite his game is winning one on one. Like he his so much of his production even this year was still at the catch point. He's still fantastic at beating guys when another defender is right on him. He has great ball skills. So I don't think he would have he wouldn't have been Chase. Like switch him and Chase. I don't think he would have been as productive as Jamar Chase was in that role. Yeah, and the other one was Herbert, obviously, which was, you know, when we built our – so I was looking backwards and looking at our analytics mock, and I looked at, like, the war generated by our first-round picks versus – and we were probably, like, a third of a win below what the, what was actually drafted, and almost all – like, 1.5 wins of that was the fact that we had didn't have Herbert in our first round, and he went in the first round and actually played pretty well. The, the question I, I think we all have is, A – was Herbert's rookie year the real deal, right? Because we, we've 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 taken victory laps on players before Baker, Herbert, you know. Yeah. And what was there? And I know he played well in the Senior Bowl last year. What was there that we missed as a collective group, but also the two of us analytically? Like, what was there that we missed? He could always make special throws on the football field. That wasn't like a debate. He had a cannon for an arm, and he could make those throws. It was the Oregon the offense was not really set up to take advantage of that mm -hmm. like they were throwing wide screens more than any offense in college football and there was a big part of the kind of the herb evaluation that's still a tbd that we were very hesitant on which was like can he play winning football and can he you know at the end of games and in crunch time look like the same guy because i, I think we even saw it in that one game where he i think called his own number on the sneak or whatever mm -hmm. was like he he, do, he did weird yeah. things like that in college. Like that was kind of his mo, where he would just have brain farts a lot more. The often end of than the New Orleans game, where he throws the ball short of the first down in overtime when you need, you know, yeah. a play. They're like he, that was kind of his mo, and why I was like, I don't know if I, he's going to be. It was almost like Ryan Tannehill esque kind of early career Ryan Tannehill, um, and so that was a big part of it. And I think almost like when fans come back and you see you, you go on the road and there's crowds, which was like his, also his problem in college was playing on the road. I think you might see a little bit of a different player. So I'm, I'm hesitant to go all it, say we were completely wrong. Justin Herbert, but the change in the offense is the thing that was just yeah. impossible to account for where he had an offense that set up for him with the guys who are better, much better contested catch receivers than he ever had at Oregon, much better at getting down the field and in an offense that throws down the field more. Well, yeah, now we have Shane Sykin leaving, going to Philadelphia mm -hmm. to, to go with uh, Sir, uh, Sirianni. Sirianni. And then, you know, he's getting a different offensive coordinator. Last season, Herbert, eight interceptions from a clean pocket, 7.1 yards per attempt. From a pressured pocket, 7.6 yards per attempt, only two interceptions. So a lot of noise there, I think, for him. It'll be interesting to see what happens here because I think expectations are going to be through the roof for him, but there's, there's a chance that he might fall. Hey, Mike fall over. always gets on the chargers bandwagon. So I anticipate <laughs> I had actually been off for yeah. the past two years. You'll be driving it once again. I, I still can't believe that Anthony Lynn coached a team that went 12 and four one year. I, I, I refuse to believe it. Let's transition to the quarterbacks in this year's draft class, because these are awesome and fun to talk about. Let's start with, the separation between Lawrence and then Fields and Wilson. Yeah. Because it feels as though just reading your mock, reading your analysis, and then looking at the outside world too, there's no question about Lawrence. How big is the gap? What's the key separator between Lawrence and then Fields and Wilson? The key separator is just kind of how comfortable you feel with Lawrence translating to the NFL. And that his the way he wins at quarterback position from the pocket and quickly and to all levels of the field quickly like he'll he'll throw in rhythm like corner routes within 2.2 seconds like hmm. they, he'll get a 30-yard throw off right away with no sort of fear in his game whereas you know Justin Fields attacks down the football field but he also lets things develop takes on the wild to get that ball going down the football field so I, I think you just feel more comfortable with Lawrence that's not going to say he's the most talented or is easily going to be the best of the bunch, but just he will translate the quickest from what we've seen from the college. Do you think? Do you think there's something inherent? I, so, for a couple questions. Lawrence has been the crown, the the guy for mm -hmm. two calendar years now. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a little bit of I, boredom's not the right word, but like something similar to what we saw with Kansas City this year in the NFL, which is like 
the coronation had happened. How do you bring this back I, to sorry, the fucking but I, Chiefs but like, every we, time? We're, this is what I feel like. All of us are overthinking Lawrence. Is, are there, is there an overthinking of Lawrence in the sense that – because I, I, I look at his statistics over the last few years, and they're not bad, but they're not – like they don't jump out at you and say, hey, this – this if I didn't know who he was, mm -hmm. I would not think he was the number one overall pick just from looking at the statistics. But is some of that just the fact that like he's playing in the ACC, which has gotten worse over the past two years? Yeah. Not his fault that that's gotten worse. He's also – like had he had a poor game against LSU. I thought he played okay against Ohio State for most of that. Like, but but really, there's like a boredom factor there. Yeah, I think, and it's also like I think I think he's unquestionably number one. And why no one's really willing to put him, no one's really willing to say, hey, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields ahead of him is because also like he has been the guy since day one. Yeah. Like you would be. You would be lampooned if you're you, know, you go against it, and then Trevor Lawrence turns out to be what everyone thinks he is, and it's like, well, okay, you're the dumbass yeah, who yeah. said Zach Wilson above him. You overthought it. Yeah, so that's that's more what it is. It's like, yeah, you could have gone Herbert over Joe Burrow last year. You could have like bought into Alex. You brand yourself into it. Yeah, yeah. but you, there's no there's no reason to with how good Trevor Lawrence. Well, is. and and the the benefits of going with the crowd are probably incrementally better than be than taking a shot at being. At being against the grain and being right because yeah. if you're wrong then everybody yeah you know, like you said lampoons you what about this compare like when i watch fields i see a little i see a better version of jalen hurts as far as the deliberateness with the football in the pocket the sort of like the release isn't necessarily as quick as i i like there and we saw jalen hurts have success this year with philadelphia there's a question mark as to whether or not he's going to be any quarter, you know, team's quarterback moving forward. But given that Hertz was a second round pick and, you know, are people thinking about, is, are we maybe. Do you think he's hurting Fields? I don't, I'm not saying he's hurting him, yeah. but I'm saying like the same reasons we didn't like Hertz as a number one overall pick or number, a, a first round draft pick. Yeah. Do those creep in? Because when I look at Zach Wilson play, I mean, like the arm talent there is just so, and his statistics, even after you regress for who they faced, yeah, his statistics are way better, Same. and you see far fewer statistical warts there. I mean, against Northwestern, he was he looked like an undraftable player in that game. What? So okay, so what separates separate Fields and Wilson? Yeah, the biggest thing is just with Wilson is how many special throws he made down the football field that were not. You know, Justin Fields will hit a go ball and Chris Olave will be open by like three or four yards. He didn't, he had Zach Wilson at time at BYU. He didn't have guys running wild, wide open down the Is Mitt field. Romney's nephews running routes yeah. for him? Like, <laughs> like, like he, his, hey, <laughs> his grade on tight window throws this year was higher than Burroughs was last year. I think it was the highest we've ever graded on tight window throws. He had the most tight window throws in the country this year, tight window completions. So when you see a guy hit, difficult throws consistently the way he did as opposed to fields where yeah he made a lot of big time throws down the football field but if he missed by like two yards short it might have still been a completion hmm. whereas zach wilson's yeah. weren't going to be completions if he didn't put it there were a lot of players that were in, in deep ball that, that were like draped all over and he just like found and then some of them were incomplete but like his grade was over 94 throwing deep left deep middle deep right like there there were just a lot of impressive throws that like in a, in the way we just saw you know Aaron Rodgers like n not necessarily in need of a platform to, to uncork that arm like I didn't think that Zach Wilson needed that either and yeah. to me like I think and again I, I, I we said well, last year we liked Fields a lot we actually mm -hmm. thought he was on par with Lawrence at times but like Fields seems like he needed a little bit more to sort of be as efficient but again they're playing big 10 defenses versus playing you know whatever the schedule was for BYU's defense yeah I think the the most indicative if they're put one stat on Justin Fields that was the most indicative stat and I think I even put this in the draft guide is that when he was blitzed this year his time to throw was higher than yes. when he was not blitzed which is like that's just not the way it goes and his was like a half second higher than the highest guy in the NFL against the blitz time to throw I think Josh Allen led the NFL in time to throw against the blitz and Justin Fields is over a half second higher which is just that doesn't work. That's the, uh, immediately something that's not going to translate to the NFL. You can't sit in the pocket against the blitz. That's not going to be feasible. It was behind Ohio State's offensive line. Once you get to the next level, like 
you got to speed up. He's got to be faster than that. And the other thing that I think that separates him and Wilson is Wilson's just – he's not as athletic. Fields is more athletic, but he's better at manipulating and, like, creating room for himself in the pocket. Fields kind of has that, like, heavy feet. Like, he, once he gets on the move, he's great. But in the pocket, he's kind of just stuck there, and then all of a sudden he can break out. But there's no sort of make a move left. There's very few throws like that on his tape. So is there is there any question in your mind – that Zach Wilson is ahead of Justin Fields and that you would take him ahead of Justin Fields? If I really want to go all in on a running game offense, if I have a you know, dominant offensive line, that's how I'm going to go. I could see going Justin Fields. But as far as passer of the football, which is like what you probably should be prioritizing and not that running game because we've seen how long quarterbacks last in such systems. I, yeah, just it's going to be Zach Wilson. Because the, the thing that I think about, and this is a lot of this is opponents that they've faced, but, and I hate to do this thing where you're like, you know, I've played sports before and like, but when you I are. Turf, my turf toe analysis on was the live show on, was, on, on, was on point. On point. Did right? Mahone... <laughs> <laughs> he was unfazed by the turf toe. But like, there is a, a, when I watch Zach Wilson, I have not watched him as much as you have, but he has a Steph Curry irrational confidence to him that I, it makes me feel like when I am playing people in basketball that are like four years younger than me, you know, when I was in like high school, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, so I wonder if he will still have that. And if he doesn't, if he has to, you know, kind of play within himself more, will he, st does he still have the consistency, the accuracy, the pocket manipulation? Because you said some of those special throws, some of the throws that you see, there's like Mahomesianness to them. Yeah. But Mahomes is great because with, bringing up the Chiefs. Because within the pocket, within the pocket, Mahomes but is don't a you magician think, too. But don't you think there's a that's the difference between these two quarterbacks? Wilson is a Holmgren Reed quarterback, and and uh, Fields is a Shanahan McVay like operator of operator of like a Cousins yeah. and a Goff and a wow. and a I Garoppolo, and whereas so then the coach the coach that takes on that takes on Wilson, like, I'm sorry, it's not going to be the Niners. I mean, I'm assuming these guys can handle those kind of co the quarterbacks, yeah. but it's not the ones they're comfortable with. Right. And it's not, you know, you, you almost need that sort of coach that will, that will uh, not only uh, live with, but encourage the, uh, the sort of out of structure yeah. stuff. Uh, and those coaches are rare because it takes a lot of like, um, I would say humility, I guess, right? Like, like Holmgren with Favre. It was just like a, an epic, like, battle of wills for a <laughs> long time. And then eventually they both, like, found a, an understanding. Whereas, like, it, it's why Shanahan, we talk about it all the time, like, Shanahan was like, like, didn't scout Mahomes. It was like, I want cousins. And then, like, Jimmy Please. G was kind of like this. Please. This and, and, you know, Jimmy G was kind of this, like, compromise for him. <sighs> but. And then where does – so I just want to ask one more question about – so the two more quarterbacks are probably going to go in the first round, right? Mac Jones. Big Mac. And and Trey Lance of, of North Dakota State. We don't have a ton of information on Lance. He didn't play that great in the mm -hmm. one game we have in the fall. He's not going to play in the spring from what I can tell. Um, and Mac Jones, there was the tweet from our main account that I thought was very illustrative, which was, you know, on his first read, his PFF grade was like 90-something and first in college football. And then off his first read, it was like 70 something. It was like 25th. Like, is there a path for Mac Jones to be, cause I, I think of these guys similarly. I think Lance is sort of a weaker, a much weaker version of Zach Wilson. I think Mac Jones is a much weaker version of Justin Fields. Is that, is that kind of, is there a path for Mac Jones to be a successful NFL quarterback? I think so. He, he is accurate. Like he's very accurate underneath with the football. He can distribute. Like you said, in the Shanahan type of system, if guys are open underneath, he's going to hit them in stride and with good timing. Like, he's very, very good at that. Doesn't have a big arm, not mobile. Like, he can beat Kirk Cousins. Like, he could beat Kirk Cousins. God Real help me. in the NFL. God help me. Now, is that not true where you drafting right Kirk Cousins? I, Kirk Cousins is value extremely valuable with a rookie deal, especially. So, if you take Jones at yeah. 20, like his his rookie deal, he's paying what four or five million dollars. That's hate a you. huge I hate come you. up, right? I hate you. But then Niners, what happens is then would you, you rather pay them Kirk draft Cousins. Mac Jones than trade up for what I said Christian Barmore, which is I think what they're going to do. Stop. This is <laughs> <laughs> this is not fair. I did not wake up this morning and deserve this kind of hatred. 
let's let's talk about the receivers though because so to set the table this receiver class incredible last year's receiver class incredible not taking into account what you saw this past year but just based on the evaluation which receiving class is better this year's or last year's Ooh, i think this year's I really do think this year's yeah even though last year's obviously came in the nfl were fantastic yeah i would go this year's there there isn't a receiver in this class in my opinion at least in the first round that requires the projection that henry ruggs and jalen rager required that's a good point right like yeah. so rugs and rugs and rager were both off the charts athletically but questions about you know for tcu it was can the guy could his quarterback couldn't throw it in the ocean so it's not his fault mm -hmm. alabama it was still, sort of still yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and alabama it was you know it was like well he's the fifth guy but you know all the other guys ahead of him are great too and like whereas when you look at every single player that's been that's going to be picked in round what like you know obviously chase um, you know, Devontae Smith is like the most productive receiver in college football history. Yeah. Uh, Waddle, of course. Um, but even look at like, um, even look at uh, Rondell Moore was like, I mean, Rondell yeah. Moore played like one freaking game before like November this year, caught like 15 balls in that game. Like the, the, you, you're you not going to have production questions out of a lot of these guys, which I think is the difference. Yeah, I think the only guy with production questions who could end up in round one is Kadarius Tony, And that's because yeah. he's just like a return man he's like a, like a, a slender freak. percy harvin yeah we're like gonna talk tough person we're gonna harvin. talk the entire offseason about how the chiefs should get tony and then they're gonna draft another running back and i'm very excited for that Here, here's a question so i've actually heard from a oh, couple good. hashtag sources that Kadarius tony is not going in round one i'm very excited for that what sources are these i i, I can't disclose okay oh, can't, yeah. I, can't divulge like so, good I'd be worried about drafting him round one. I'd honestly... Is, is it character? Then oh. your Chiefs will take him in round one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> He'll fit in. Let's, <laughs> he's a Chief through and through. Okay, let's break these down. You have Jamar Chase. Yes. Number one receiver. And it's there's a gap there. Mm -hmm. Why? He's physically more translatable to the NFL when you have a guy who's six foot six one maybe 205 pounds versus two guys in the 180s maybe in the 170s for Devonte smith size matters like once you get to the league the cornerbacks are all six foot 200 pounds when you're giving up 20 pounds it's just a different animal at that point so questions about the other guys translating whereas jamar chase what he did in college should translate to the nfl when he was 19 when he was doing it in college with you know Devonte smith fantastic year he's 22 years old yeah year. you know well, Jamar chase will be two years in the league well don't you think the evolution of the league plays into this too where it's less now in the nfl about contested catches and it's more about getting open and timing and if you're slender at wide receiver and you can't get off press like it if that's your if yeah. that's a consistent issue with you and you're a second or two behind the you know or not a, you know a quarter of a second behind in yeah. your routes like that's a significant issue right whereas from what i can tell chase is not going to have that problem whereas smith and waddle might be okay but there's questions like if you go up and jam them yeah that, that's just the thing it, it's now uh, i'm not saying chase is a sure th any of these guys are a sure thing or a sure thing to be able to get off press right away but bigger receivers have more ways to get off press coverage when you're jalen waddle Devontae smith it's literally just making guy miss yeah. so if you, who's, who's if you put hold on you put all the receivers from the last two classes in the same group jamar chase receiver one wide receiver one yes probably now jerry judy was the best just like pure separator of that bunch in my opinion like just could get open at a different level like no one's going to be able to guard that guy but then his ball skills and then contest catches were not there and that's still a part a, a fairly significant part of playing wide receiver in the NFL, broad, that's not with Jay. Broad Jamar question. Chase, uh, question. Has the chasm between the haves and have-nots in the NFL grown because the league was too stupid to pick a wide receiver in the top 10 last year? Because to me, so we're watching that draft mm -hmm. and we're thinking to ourselves, Derek Brown's going off the board, right? And Derek Brown's a good football player, don't get me wrong. All these tackles are going off the board. All these, all these uh, you know, defensive players going off the board. And we wait, really, and, and Ruggs obviously was an outlier picked by Oakland or uh, Vegas, but really it got to pick, what, 17, 18, 19 before right. the true number one receiver in that class was taken? Well, the Broncos are, like, losing their mind at 15 because yeah, they're going to get Judy. 
Exactly. Yeah. So and and now you look at the AFC and NFC title games this year, and the whole story is these teams have wide receivers for days. Do you think? Because I I actually put down what you know, and, and like I think there's three wide receivers taken in the top ten in this draft out of out of sort of a reaction to what we saw this season, which is that wide receivers win in the NFL, and especially with quarterback play that is going to be as transient as we've ever seen with Stafford and Jameis and big, you know, all the people moving around. Do we see wide receivers actually taken high this year? I still don't think so. Yeah. I still I don't agree think with will you. because teams, because there is still, you can get guys at the top of the second, but I will say when you watch the championship games this year, if you're, I said this on the, the two for one drafts. If your wide receiver course don't look like these wide receiver yeah. course, you're not going to compete with these yeah. teams. And I mean, unless you have Bay. you have to have like the Ravens secondary, and then even then, yeah, think about this. The think about this. The teams that lost in the conference championship had top five wide receivers, but the drop off between their best wide receiver and the next guy was yeah. literally falling off Mount Everest. The yeah. Chiefs and the Bucks had have receivers coming out of their ears the bucks didn't have antonio brown yeah. and scotty miller is out here taking kevin king sticking him on one of those spits they put <laughs> pigs on in hawaii and roasting that yeah. motherfucker i well, mean slow do you do you see do you see back and we'll talk i think you you talked about this um this player at length this year and we were lucky enough to see him a lot in the sec do you think kelsey and kittle's performance for two of the best Ooh. teams over the last two years make like does Kyle Pitts go like top I mean is he is he the highest drafted tight end more rare yeah I think he's a more rare player for his position than Jamar Chase is for wide receiver yeah and the drop off because I you know I was looking through this I mean Pat Fryermuth might go top 30 top 25 but like I you know watching him play like he's he's a He's just he's a good tight end. Yeah. You know, he's a Kyle Brady of the back in the day. He's not like of he's not this kind of prospect. So the not only to your point about um, you know, wide receiver, there's a ton of them, right? And teams might like convince themselves they can wait. Like you can't wait for Kyle Pitts if that's yeah. your guy. Like if you're Atlanta at four or you're, you know, uh, Cincinnati at five or like I mean, he's going there, isn't don't, he? Don't don't you think I think Pitts is going ahead of Waddle and Smith. Mm, maybe not Smith, but I, I, he's going to go ahead of one of those three. Would you take him ahead of those two guys? <sighs> That's tough. I, I still don't love like even like the thought of a tight end. Like I, I would. Yeah, yeah. You never like tight ends. Yeah. Realistically, yeah. like now. No, and I'm I with you. Kyle Pitts can win one on one, and he's a, he's a nice matchup weapon, but. I don't even I don't even need the tight end in my offense. Basically, yeah. is how I feel about tight end. Oh, so, so here's the question then, because I I sort of agree with you in the sense that, like, no one except for Andy Reid would know what to do with Travis Kelsey in many ways, right? Like in another or, or offense, Shanahan with Kittle, right? Yeah. I mean, like those. And, but even Kittle, Kittle is, in my opinion, too much of a traditional tight end to have as much value because those guys get hurt. Like doing the shit that Kittle does on a week week basis, like leaves you prone to getting hurt all the time. At least yeah, with Kelsey, they like unlock him from the line don't of scrimmage and have him like dare. you're on two strikes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, yeah. I, I, I sort of you. agree with Mike in that sense. And, and Kelsey's really a, a th like a, a receiver, right? And Kittle is Well that, and that's Pitts. Pitts yeah, is and, a receiver. Yeah. And, and so the question is is does he have value to the rest of the league um, who might, you know, other than maybe San Fran, you're a team that yeah. knows how to use him. Maybe, maybe we are overvaluing him because the league might not know even how to use him. You have, you have pits uh, to San Fran, right? Or you uh, talked about it. I haven't had a mock in a while. If you I had a mock, I can't remember. But Someone did. Daniel I Jeremiah. Had, I have, that's right. Daniel Jeremiah. Had I kind of like him that. at eight to Carolina, right? Ooh, Carolina needs a quarterback. Interesting. I think they need it. I think they need another defensive tackle. Okay. One last question on the receivers. Yeah. Everyone's mocking Devonte Smith, like top three, you know, four or five, like way ahead of everybody else. But you have Waddle one spot ahead of him. Why? Waddle was when they were both healthy this year. Waddle had more yards. Waddle outproduced Devonte Smith when they were both healthy. He's younger much better athlete um i think he has very good ball skills he's more dynamic with the ball in his hands Devonte smith's better at the catch point but and 
he's also Javante Smith's really skinny, and that is a question mark. Jalen Waddles, while he's only probably about ten pounds heavier, is also three inches shorter, which he's not as skinny. Like he's dense. Like people say, Tyreek Hill is small, but Tyreek Hill is like a rock. So that's kind of like Jalen Waddle, where he's yeah, he's undersized, but he's also kind of a rock, and he's a physical dude in his own right. I think he played like corner or safety in back in high school, and has some like hits on his. I watched his high school tape, and it was like had some hammer shots so look i watched henry ruggs high school <laughs> tape and that's uh, basketball tape fairness but sold that me. was pretty dope yeah um it, well so here's one of the things that i love about the draft guide is even if you're just skimming you can get a ton of information because of the biggest strength biggest weakness the bottom line the player comparison all that stuff and then you can dive in obviously if you want well watching tyreek hill this weekend the thing that everyone was absolutely erect about was how fast twitch he is and someone made the point, it's like, not only is he fast, but he is quick. And that combination yeah. is impossible to guard. And the biggest strength that you have for Jalen Waddle is his twitch, which I mean, I might need, like my pants will be off if he's available and the Niners have an opportunity. I, I think um, that's I think the it, thing, like Ruggs was 429. He was not 653 cone, which was what Tiger Kill was. He was right, probably yeah. like a seven something. Like he just wasn't yeah. like, that kind of athlete Jalen Waddle is closer to that kind of athlete where like he's fast in a straight line but also fast laterally yeah no no DK Metcalf here's a question I have so I I kind of looking at this is there a chance that there's less how many defensive players do you think go in the top 10 Oof, that's a good question I have to like think this one through a little bit mm, maybe Micah Parsons although he has like character issues himself didn't play this this didn't year which this is year. which is a um, after him, probably I'd say two cornerbacks yeah. are likely Farley. So Far Far Farley, Farley from Virginia. And, yeah, Caleb Farley from Virginia Tech, and then Patrick Sertan yeah. from Alabama. Like nine and ten there. Like Broncos need a cornerback. Cowboys need a quarter cornerback. Yeah. If Broncos don't draft quarterback, that's probably where they go. And so I'd say two. Here's a galaxy brain thing I think for Dallas though. Oh, good. I think Dallas takes the Barmore guy because they're they're gonna look at the <laughs> they're gonna look at the, yes. the last season of getting just this all trained <laughs> run and, and run defense and they're gonna think, well, we need to we need to, to well, Mike remember when Mike Nolan was an Niners coach, every single guy they drafted. I, actually he, I forgot he he said I went to therapy this is, for that. This is what we this is what we want the Niners. This is what this is what we want the Niners to look like. I think Mike McCarthy, although he fired Nolan, is gonna say Christian Barmore is what we want Dallas to look like. I agree. With, what is the thing? People so, get so enamored with big dudes. Our our projections like Farley more than Sertan. Mm -hmm. Is that just was Sertan given tougher assignments? I I feel like that's might be one of the reasons why. Because why what? Yeah, like that we we have are... him. We have Sertan projected with a little bit lower like playmaker rates so or pass breakups, okay. interceptions, and a higher completion percentage allowed is that i mean he did great as well as farley farley was awesome the year before yeah uh so like i don't think that's anything crazy sertan's not he's not that fast either like he's probably gonna run the four right. fives and so i think that's why he's gonna not be hmm. like Interesting. not gonna be thought of as you know maybe some alabama cornerbacks in years past like uh d milliner or mick fitzpatrick where they're you know three-year starters where you're just like okay uh, alabama cornerback draft the top 10 he'll be good no, Patrick Sertan's like kind of slow. And so he gave up some big plays uh, this past year. So that's why. Like Farley really didn't give up big plays because he runs he probably in the four threes. Yeah. In that year. yeah. All right, let's do this. We're going to do some quick ones. Let's go around the horn. Teams that should trade up. All right. Even though we talk about you're on the two for one drafts pod and uh, we are always team trade down, but there are situations where trading up is good. Michael, let you go first. Team that should trade up. The Denver Broncos should trade up in this draft class. For a quarterback? For a quarterback. Yes. I mean, fuck, yeah. nowhere else would make sense. <laughs> but, yeah, the Denver Broncos. Drew Locke, I wrote the article this early on Monday. and said, stop talking yourself into bad quarterbacks. Like, there's no – like, and don't – the quarterback can also develop on the bench. If he's really that good, he should be able to yeah. develop on the bench. One of the best – one of the best stories in league history from the quarterback position – was Mahomes, here we go. Drew Brees. <laughs> oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like and and the San Diego Chargers, God bless them, were like, fuck it. We we're not we don't, t life's too short to wait for Drew Brees to come around. And they they traded and they got Philip Rivers. And then Drew Brees came around and was good. And that's fine. Like that that's allowed to yeah. happen. It, he, yeah. You're allowed to let these guys compete. And that was the whole point. 
you know, you talk about Denver, but like last year, Washington at two, like Chase Young's a great football player, but I bet you they wanted it, would have wanted a young quarterback in December and January this year when they were trying to secure that, at, you know, NFC East uh, title. It's like the same thing, like you look at, you know, uh, Philadelphia at six, obviously, Detroit at seven. Now, Detroit was at three with Jeff Akuda, right? Akuda, one of the least valuable players in football this year. Not, so not saying he can't recover, but. Now they're picking at seven, seven. because yeah. it's a lot. It's really freaking hard to pick in the top three, and now they're 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 basically outside of the top three guys territory unless they move up. That's my answer, by the way, is Detroit. I think Detroit needs to move up and and take a quarterback that will bite off some people's kneecaps. I'll say my thought on Detroit though, they're going to have the number one pick in twenty twenty two. How is this roster going to win games? I mean, you know. how is the entire team, the entire situation? Dan Campbell leading this group of chickens with their heads. So you're cut saying off. they're just gonna they're gonna sign Tyrod Taylor. Anthony Lynn's gonna have Taylor for the third straight team he's he's coached, and something like that. Like, and, I, I mean, they're they're gonna, gonna, they could go own sixteen. But here's well, here's my issue with Tyrod Taylor. Not a good team. Buffalo wanted to do the same exact fucking thing in 2017. Tyrod Taylor's too good to tank with. That's what I'm saying. Like they'll go nine and seven because the Vikings stink yeah. and the Bears stink and the Packers. Sorry, Mike might stink if they have to start Jordan Love. Thanks. And and they they go nine and seven and win the division. And now they're picking 16th and they got Tyrod as their quarterback. Yeah. Okay. My answer is uh, the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. Uh, the Niners need to trade up because I don't think they're going to end up going to get uh, Deshaun Watson. And trading for Matt Stafford is taking a very near-term view on a team that should not be doing that. They have too many great young players. They have a young coach. Go get a quarterback that you feel confident in that you can build around. And I think there are teams that are ripe for trading up with. The Jets, the Dolphins, and the Falcons are all right there. And they should all be interested the Niners need to go get one of those guys. I also think a rushing threat in Kyle Shanahan's offense. He hasn't had it since RG3. And like put yeah. together yeah. maybe the most outlier season of anyone's career. He ever. would make fields great. You know? Yeah, exactly. That's so what I'm saying. Like that even more so in today's NFL would be Can we can we talk for a second about the Stafford thing? Because I do think it influences a lot of what's gonna happen in the draft. A lot of people are asking about Stafford. And I and I don't I think the number of circumstances where Stafford makes any sense is actually smaller than what people think. Because everybody's made excuses for Stafford, whether it be bad support, bad defense, X, Y, and Z. Any team that's gonna acquire Stafford is gonna have to give up something, give up enough, where that's true about the the destination for Stafford, isn't it? Like like somebody asked me about New Orleans. For one, they don't have any money, but I'm like, to make Stafford work there, your team's gonna suck out loud. And then you're going to be making excuses about Stafford having nothing to work with. Like if he goes to Houston, it's the same freaking thing. My only pushback would be that the coaching in Detroit has been. But Bevel was fine. Like fine. And Stafford does this every single time. When when they fired, I can't remember what their coordinator was with Caldwell, but they fired him and Jim Bob Cooter comes in and it was like the resurrection. And then Cooter gets fired. That was just the name thing. And, and then they they and his first year with Bevel, everybody's Legendary. edging out about his first year with Bevel. Offensive coordinator. And Jim Bob. like I don't know. Stafford just see, Stafford just seems to me like a bet that isn't a good one for almost every team. I think Indianapolis, Pittsburgh. Maybe the Los Angeles Rams. Someone is that all this quarterback stuff going around. It's just dating for most people, where they go. You know what? I was with so and so for so long. We didn't get along, but here's this person. Actually, it's the same fucking person you were just dating. Yeah. They just have a different name, and then you're going to get tired of them. That's the that's the Matt Stafford thing. Okay, we're going to get out of here on this, Mike. You pride yourself on your guys. Oh yeah. Your guys are the best guys right now. Yeah, it's subject to change. You. Who are Mike Renner's guys right now? All right. My first one, I got. I have to have a Notre Dame guy every year. Tommy Tremble, I would highly recommend. I'll, I'll tweet out a prize and clips of him at some point. He's a fullback, in my opinion. He plays like fullback, tight end, H-back there for Notre Dame. Oh, he's perfect he's, for the Packers. He's the next great fullback. This guy is the next great fullback in the NFL. This, I, I already can see it. The Niners are turning the draft card now. And he also runs like probably like in like the four, maybe high four fives, low four sixes at fullback. So what if so they win be... Pitts round one, Tremble like round six, <laughs> and now they, they're running 22 personnel? I, I'm here for it. So Tommy Tremble, okay. awesome, awesome fullback. 
Um, and then our Darius Washington, the safety from TCU, he is five foot eight, 178 pounds. And he apparently can clean 380 pounds. Wow. He is a monster. The guy That's hits insane. like a brick. Yeah, like an <laughs> actual, he was on uh, Bruce Feldman's freaks list, like has some other ridiculous numbers in the weight room that he is just, and Fuck. like does not miss assignments on the back end. He only gave up 170 yards his whole college career. What college. could you clean right now? <laughs> Uh, my living room, probably. I should. <laughs> what about you? You hit a clean recently? I've been doing. I've been doing snatch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. I unfortunately right. not. Any other? God damn it! Any other guys? <laughs> you you. I actually you wanted real answers. You set it up. Uh, I got to go. One more. A wide receiver, Jalen Darden from North Texas. He's like five, another small guy, I guess. Five nine, like one seventy five. He showed up to North Texas, one hundred and fifty pounds. Dude, Dude North Texas college. offense was bananas in some games last year. <laughs> yeah, and so he is probably a four three guy, very athletic. Reminds me a lot of names like Darnell Mooney, the guy who went to the Bears last year. Out Tulane, ended up in the fifth round. Very similar sort of size, speed guys that you know you're not going to draft a guy from North Texas in the first. You're going to look ridiculous, but he is offers a lot of the similar things to what you'd like reach for in the first when it's like a guy who has that sort of speed and downfield ability that makes sense uh favorite comp Oof. okay uh my favorite one i like i had some like jokey ones i did my one trey lance one i trey did lance, taste some hill with an arm <laughs> they can actually throw so like that that one i think is also and like, and like seven less rings around the on yeah, the trunk there. runs yeah. around the sun. <laughs> um, more realistically, our Darius Washington to uh, Honey Badger to Tyre Matthew. I think there's like Tyre, Tyre Matthew's not a the fastest safety in the world. He's not you know, obviously Big the biggest. All. It's like he's yeah. tiny, but you're never like oh our uh, Tyre Matthew can't. You never like, wonder not if physical he's a enough. physical presence. Exactly. Right? exactly, not physical enough at that size. That's to me is our Darius Washington. You're like. You're not going to have the length. He's not going to have the speed that you want. But, like, you're never going to question basically his ability. I'm sold. Yeah. That's the uh, NFL Draft Guide, PFF NFL Draft Guide. Go get you one. Go listen to the two-for-one drafts pod with Mike and Austin. Not only is the football content great, but Austin's stories are first off endless. Dude, and I B, each one, each new one that he tells is the greatest story I've it's ever deeper. Stephanie was rolling – we were watching that like on the background. Oh, and, like, Molly, you guys do that. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, when when Austin was telling the story about his dad, like driving away. And, I like, mean, there, I was. Which one about his dad? There's, uh, like, there's, there's uh, go listen to two for one draft spot to get you ready. Get yourself a draft guide, Mike. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you, fellas. Yeah. Special thank you to Mike Renner, who um, always has good stuff to say about draft and draft prospects. And that's really his area of expertise. I wouldn't bring him in here um, to talk about many other things. But the draft, I honestly don't think there's anyone better than Mike Renner on the draft. And that's including all of the guys that are out there. Dude works his ass off and um, has a lot of good stuff to say. Okay. You ready for a Bachelor update? This is like four episodes. I need it. In. I need it. I need it. Okay. I need it. So I've got, I've got some notes here. Um, and this is, so I'll preface it with this. I think this is the worst episode, uh, worst season of The Bachelor that I have yet seen. And part of it is, I'm not a huge fan of the girls. I'm not a huge fan of- Like their of, personalities or- uh, Kind of the whole their, accoutrement. Their career choices. It's uh, just personality, look, career choice, the whole okay. thing. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So girls aren't the greatest group. Um, but here's the real rub, is that Matt James, former Wake Forest football player is The Bachelor. And he is a great guy, nice dude, but he doesn't have like that like it factor where you're like waiting for him to say something or do something. So it's not great. Kind but, of a Russell Wilson personality wise maybe? Yes. Now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you my notes here. Okay. Girls are walking in. Three girls in. Girl shows up, pulls out her friend. Oh, okay. Gotcha says this is what got me through the pandemic it's a vibrator oh so it actually was yeah was her friend wow good for you good good word choice next uh girl that shows up is um a, a girl whose name is kit 
K-I-T. Not like kitten. Stands for keep in touch. Uh, then a chick walks in with a crown who actually calls herself Queen Victoria. This shtick does not end. She continues to think she's a queen. At one point, rips a tiara off another girl's head. I'm convinced she's a paid actor because the producers go, we need some help. What is the, what is the fixation with royalty? Princesses, yeah, queens? It's, it's very interesting. I don't get it. Okay, so she's a paid actress that they're keeping. They're all, uh, well, not, they're not all paid actresses. No. <laughs> some of them are there for the right reasons. Uh, girl then comes in. I just thought this was a funny anecdote. Um, she's actually one of my um, favorites on the show because she seems normal. She's from Cumming, Georgia. <laughs> Okay, here's the best part though. You ready for this? So all the girls are in there. Matt James walks in. They're sitting around. It's the first time all the girls have seen him. And he says, usually they give a toast. Oh no. He starts with a prayer. Nice. That's My what guy reads. It's not like we hope, you know, it's not yeah, like yeah, 10 it's not seconds. A quickie. It's not a, it's not a. This is like a 70 second prayer. And I am, I am dying of laughter. But the show goes basically downhill from there. That was the most entertaining part of the entire. That sort of, of reminds me season. of my college years where I, I met a woman from Climax, Minnesota. Wow. Yeah, it's like a there you little go. town near Moorhead. There you go. So, I, I, interestingly, all of those things, <laughs> all of those things are from the first episode, which tells you how the whole season has been. It's basically been downhill from there, but the first episode and some of those uh, introductions. I, thought I, you I don't. I don't get the whole. Th the whole like. I I feel like that's incongruent. The 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 prayer with the the whole like the whole the thing gestures at everything about the show. Yeah, I thought you'd <laughs> enjoy that quite a bit. Uh, it is. <laughs> It's by the it's way, so good. coming Georgia, by the way, yeah. it was also on one, one college trip I went on in uh, for spring break. We, we drove through like the whole country intercourse. Pennsylvania was obviously, Oh, it's just right outside of Hershey. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> you could do a whole thing on this. Um, that's the bachelor update. Uh, I don't think I have any others. I'm looking at my notes and, and I don't, so that's it. We'll be back on Sunday. Sunday. We're going to talk Super Bowl props in in a much deeper uh i can't sorry the intercourse the coming all of that stuff <laughs> we're going to talk a lot about super bowl props but also the daily betting podcast you and ben brown are going to dive into the props uh is it tomorrow night yeah so friday morning will come out the the westgate like the soup you know the, the super the, contest prop sheet the prop sheet will Whatever be out um if you want to go to pff.com we have actually unlike most weeks we have uh, actually like put in a, a ton more props they're available with the props tool mm -hmm. um our, our colleague ben brown has done a really good job of of trying to price these out um obviously some of them are our model but some of them are just you know ad hoc as somebody would during a, a week like this um so you know anything from whether the first kickoff will be a touchback to whether the first play is a runner pass yep. all those cool things we want to go to pff.com but obviously we'll talk about that uh, on Sunday, and then obviously the subsequent Wednesday, we'll talk uh, about you know everything associated with the big game. It's going to be a lot of fun. By the way, Super Bowl twenty five is the promo code. You can get the prop stool for twenty five percent off. So you should go make that happen. We'll see you guys on Sunday. Enjoy the week without football. Get some rest. Prepare yourself. It's going to be fun. See y'all.